Thank you, Maggie. Happy Women's Day. Happy Women's Day. Very good, very good. How are you this evening? Good. I'm um, very happy to be here. And um, as Maggie said, we were introduced by our good friend Caroline. <coughs> by Caroline. And, um, uh, you know, when I walked up the stairs, I felt very intimidated for a good number of reasons. One is because I've been told stories of the kind of people in this room. And I clearly have heard your ambitions. Uh, we've got future presidents in this room. We've got future secretary generals of the UN in this room, isn't it? Uh, we've got uh, fantastic mothers in this room and fathers. And, um, and therefore, what I'm looking at in front of me is future success. And you know, today at my age, when I think about a few years down the line, I know I'll be at home probably watching TV complaining about some of you who will be presidents, isn't it? and not being able to reach you, but you'll be making all the decisions that affect me. So um, it is uh, for that reason that I feel quite intimidated. But um, before, um, I'm told that I should say something about myself and then we open the room for discussion. Is that okay? And for questions. I've been warned you ask a lot of questions. <laughs> so um, uh, please use tonight to ask as many questions as you need. Maggie also told me I can choose what to answer, isn't it? Very good. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, as Maggie said, today I run a bank called NIC Bank. For those of you in Uganda, you may not know it because it's called NC Bank in Uganda. Uh, we were stopped from using the name NIC because there's another, there's an insurance company there that calls itself NIC, yeah? So we are called NC Bank in Uganda. Um, I've been back in the country now for two years. Um, I spend a lot of my time overseas. I was telling Maggie, we were comparing notes, and I spent 19 years in the United States. I know my accent doesn't say it, but I did. <laughs> um, and then I spent five in South Africa. All that time in search of a dream. All that time in search of a dream. I was born in a small village in Kenya, whose name most of you cannot pronounce. It's called Kamahendu. Can you pronounce that? <laughs> oh, you, you're good. Huh? You're good. I'm impressed. So I grew up, I grew up there, and um, you know, a little, little boy. I was never chubby. I'm still not too chubby, I hope. Um, but um, uh, you know, in a peasant farming family, that's what I grew up doing. And really, tell you the truth, my, I remember my, the, the first time I wrote an essay, and I was asked what I wanted to be, right? I think you all did those in school, right? And there was a time you asked what you wanted to be, you don't remember what you wrote. But the first time I remember writing an essay on what I want to be, I think I was in class four. And I remember saying I wanted to be an engineer. And I wrote I want to be an engineer. And then I went ahead to describe what an engineer does. And it went like this, I want to be an engineer. Because engineers drive big trains. And I want to drive trains and I want to operate those big machines called trains and blah, 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 but it went on, right? Now, there's a class four boy. In the village, the biggest machine I had seen was a, was a train, isn't it? It was a train, that's all I had seen. And many years down the line, I did become an engineer, clearly not driving trains, but an, an electrical engineer. And, but to get to there, I, had to dream. And when it was explained to me what an engineer did, I said, I want to be that engineer. And in my journey of leadership, there are points that I certainly will mention that probably define that path. My first real point of reference in terms of leadership was actually in high school. I was in Form 3, yeah? I was in Form 3. I hope the other people from the other countries know what Form 3 is. Yeah, you all know? Very good. I was in, huh? Secondary, secondary 3. And in my high school, in Secondary 3, or in Form 3, we took over the leadership of what you call the junior clubs. Yeah? So there was Junior Debating Club, Junior, junior Geographical Club, Junior Language, Junior this, right? With all these clubs. And you took leadership in Form 3. Now, 
I went in the old system, which had O level and A levels, which is why this was called junior. Okay, I think today is just called debating club, isn't it? And um, during the elections, during the second term, we had elections, and I was elected as a chairman of one of the clubs. And I remember going home during the break, very excited to my father, who was a man who never really been to formal school. Yeah, he's never been to formal school. He was a peasant farmer, as I said, and I told him. Dad, you, you know, can you believe I was elected chairman? And very excited. You know, a kid can be very excited. I was elected chairman. It's my first real point of reference for leadership. And he said, wow, fantastic. Well done. What are you a chairman of? Of? And I said, Dad, you'll be very proud of me. I chose what you've taught me. I'm the chairman of the Young Farmers Club. <laughs> and he did not look excited. He looked at me. And he said, what do you mean? Young Farmers Club? I said, yes, Young Farmers Club, Dad. That's what you told me. I'm a farmer. That's what we've been doing. He looked at me and said, you mean I'm a farmer? I taught you all this. I didn't go to school. So you think I'm taking you to school to be like me? And he said, I want you to be a leader. So I asked him, so yeah, but there's a leadership. And he said, if you want to be a leader, the first thing you must do is communicate. This is a guy who never went to school, huh? The first thing you must do is learn to communicate. You told me, didn't you mention a debating club somewhere? And I said, yes, but that's for guys from town. You know, it's not for guys like us. We have the fi we're from the village. And he said, very good. If you want to improve yourself, don't join what you already know. Join what you, what you don't know. And that still rings bells in my head. When I think about my leadership journey, I went back, and even though I was chairman of the Young Farmers Club, I made sure I participated in the debating club every opportunity that arose. With my bad accent, back then it was a lot worse than it is today, I still participated. I still tried. But you see, leadership, the first point of leadership is self-improvement. Leadership is about you. Often we talk about leadership in reference to others, isn't it? We talk about leadership in reference to others, never to the leader. When you say leader, there must be a follower, isn't it? But sometimes you can actually be a leader without followers. Because at that point, I was a leader without a follower. Yeah? I was improving myself. I was leading myself towards my own dreams. And then, in Form 5, as I said, was the old system. I was the last of the old system. So in Form 5, we, I got an opportunity to go to America on an exchange program. My school had an exchange program with an American school. And I was selected. And I was selected really because I was, one, I was a good student. But two, what the teacher said was, you, if we don't go on this trip, you never get an opportunity to go to the States. Everybody else could. You can't. Yeah? I was a pretty poor student, as you can imagine, in terms of money. So I was given an opportunity to go, and I spent the time, the time I was there for two months, I spent it trying to figure out how a poor boy could land back in America for education. Whereas everybody else was having fun. People I went with were having a fantastic time. I asked my, uh, my host master, to take me to see these universities, the likes of MIT, the likes of Harvard, and I would spend time talking to the admissions to find out what do I need to do? How can I self-improve to come here? And I can tell you within those two months, by the time I came back, I was 100% sure that I would get into one of those schools because I'd done my homework. Again, leadership is about making sure that you use the resources around you. Yeah. Use the resources around you. Everything around you is a reference book. Use it. Okay? And then I came back, applied to schools. I was admitted to MIT. And I got my letter for admission again in second term of the school. Um, was it actually not second term, first term, end of first term. It was April. I got a letter of admission. And it was one of those, I guess they call it bittersweet, right? You see it, you're so joyful. But when I read it, I also knew I could not afford it. 
So I was happy for a day and very unhappy for many days before I went home. And when the term, when the break came and I went home, and again I broke the story to my father and my, well, my parents, and I got, thought they would be very excited. And again, they were excited for a moment. In the second moment, my father was actually very upset with me. Very upset with me. This is a true story. We did not speak for a week. And that was a long week in the village because there's nothing else you do than be told, take care of the cows, do this, right? So when your father cannot give you those instructions, you know it's tough, right? It's tough. But why couldn't we speak for a week? Because he said, you put me in a very embarrassing situation. You have gotten into what you tell me is a fantastic school. You went and applied without talking to me. And now you've come. And you've given me an opportunity to let you down. Because I know you can't go. And again, it was a burst of leadership. Because I remember telling my dad, through my mother, because we were not talking, right? At this point, I'm sending my mother to go talk to this old man. Can you tell the cranky husband of yours that he need not worry, we'll find a way. I will find a way. And after a week, we talked. My mother made sure, uh, he, you know, she reconciled us, which is why mothers are strong. And we talked. And I told him, as long as you find a way to get me a ticket to the United States, let me worry about the fees. And I went back to school, talked to my master. We wrote to the school and said, this boy is poor. He cannot afford a cent to go to school. And... Shortly thereafter, we got a letter saying full scholarship. Yeah? Full scholarship. And again, it's not giving up. It is fighting. Yeah? We kept fighting. Well, I kept fighting at every instance. And then probably the next points I'll reference um, on my journey. And you notice the theme, a lot of it is about self-improvement. Yeah? I'm not going into followers yet about self-improvement, was when I joined, um, when I left MIT, I joined Wall Street. And we were recruited in a class of, we were 45 of us from various schools, yeah? And um, I think I was the only African uh, with a lot of other races in that class. And um, we were recruited by Credit Suisse um, today. And they had a program where they would recruit 45 students and you'd come work for two years in their technology department. And after two years, you'd find a position within the banking side. Or if you don't, you continue within the technology department. But if you're bad, they fire you. Yeah, That was the program they had. And um, when I joined, um, the two years that I was there, I was there for slightly less than two years, I remember very clearly that myself and this guy who was called Karim Saragadin, he was Egyptian but brought up, in, you know, born and raised in the U.S., we emerged as the natural leaders of the group. We were not appointed, but whenever we sat, and I'm sure in class you see that, there's always people who just somehow become the natural leaders, isn't it? We sort of became the natural leaders of the class. We were the ones who challenged the status quo, we are the ones who needed to make sure that, you know, if it's training, it was relevant to our class. We are the ones who argued that you can't take 45 smartest kids and decide that after two years they don't have jobs, they must guarantee us jobs. We are the ones agitating all these things. And I reference that because actually it has helped me to where I am today. Because what happened was this Kareem guy got a job earlier on to be a true investment banker. And when it came to his time for promotion, after a year, so he left after a year after he joined, I was still in the technology department, he was asked to recommend someone. And naturally, he said, the only person I know who can do this job, who not, he was told, you are getting promoted, get someone that will not embarrass you. And that's how my name was called from my class. I didn't go looking for the job, I just got a call. And I was told, come and see us. You've been highly recommended by Karim, your colleague. Now, Karim was not a friend. Okay? He's not a friend. He was never a friend. 
and I'll quickly tell you his story very soon. He was not a friend of mine, but he was one of the smartest people I ever met. I must say that. We're in the same class, but one of the smartest fellows I ever met. But what stood out for him was I was certainly the guy with the strongest accent in that class, for sure, in that group, yeah? I was the guy who had to say things twice for anyone to understand what the hell I was saying, right? <laughs> but he knew that when it came to doing stuff, I got it done. When it came to putting the time, I put the time. When it came to self-improvement, I put it first. And so he told his boss, if you get this guy, when he comes, you may not understand what the hell he's saying, but trust me, <laughs> if you give him the job, you'll do it well. And that's how I got hired. That's actually how I became an investment banker. The story of Kareem, let me just go there for a moment. The story of Kareem is that he still is, in my mind, one of the most brilliant chaps I've ever met. He went on, and um, together, he and I founded... Those of you, you know anything about the 2008 economic crisis or financial crisis? You know what caused it? Or rumor has it? What caused it? Huh? The housing projects, yes. In more detail. They blame Wall Street. So what caused it on Wall Street? Mm. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm. Okay. So you're all right. So that was the end product. But they all say that on Wall Street, they created these sophisticated financial instruments. I'm sure you've heard that, yeah? I'm sure you've watched the movies, you know, the House of Cards, um, you know, all those movies about the Lehman Brothers and what caused it to crash. So if you read the books today that talk about the 2008 economic crisis, they all talk about the mortgage-backed securities, yeah? They all talk about CDOs, collateralized debt obligations. Have you heard of that? Yeah, these are derivatives that were created on houses. Yeah, it's where you take many mortgages, you aggregate them together, and you create one mortgage, and you sell it as a mortgage. And then you create another. You take one of those many mortgages, you join them again, and you create another mortgage, you sell it. Okay, so it's a pyramid of these, yeah? And the argument is always, if you get 50 mortgages, if you've got 50 people who have borrowed money, the chance that they will all default is probably zero, isn't it? Yeah? So you work through the math, and at some point you say, through the, for those of you who are mathematicians, using binomi binomial expansion, you can calculate the probability that X number of those people will default. Yeah? And if you can, with certainty, say out of those 50, 10 will default, it means you can, with certainty, say that 40 will never default. You don't know who, right? But you know 40 will never default. So you can promise somebody that is sure, guaranteed money, isn't it? And you sell it as risk free money. That's the argument. And then you take those and then you aggregate them again. And you say, now, 40 we know will not default. If I add it to another 50 and another 50, the chance that again all would default is zero. Yeah? Then you calculate again the probability and you sell that. And that combination is called collateralized debt obligations. Okay? To use this, as I'm saying, binomial expansion. Don't worry about the math. But Kareem and I were the first two people to put together the model that the rating agencies used to rate those instruments, okay? So when you read the books about the crash of Wall Street and these instruments were created, you're looking at one of the creators. I can tell you for a fact how we did it, okay? I was there. So 
So, but Karim went on to become a big trader with Credit Suisse. And the last, um, then he moved to the UK and um, he tried to persuade me to move with him, but he was one of those fantastic, smart people, but uh, pardon my, my language, but an asshole, uh, an asshole leader, you know what I mean? Terrible leader. Excuse my language, eh, Mike, is it okay? The all adults in this room, I can say that, right? But, a ter you know, one of those torturous leaders, right? Torturous, he just enjoyed torturing you because he is the type of guy who will leave work at midnight and make sure that he calls you before he leaves work to give you work that he needs to review at 7 a.m. That's the type of character, huh? You know what I mean? Yeah, you've, you've met them somewhere, huh? You, you know them, huh? Yes, those guys. So, but Kareem, as I said, smart guy, went on, ran the trading desk in London for Credit Suisse, and then lost them $2.5 billion. In that time, he was being paid $20 million a year. And last time I saw Karim, he was on his way to prison. So be careful what some of the leaders you follow, okay? But I did not go to prison. I did not qualify. I did not cause crisis. I did not, all those things, huh? But, um, I give that story only to show that, you know, leaders that, you know, you're celebrated as a leader at the end, not at the beginning. Okay? When Mandela was in prison, we, don't, we did not think of him as a leader. It's until he was out and he did what he did that we all talk about him. Okay? So leadership is not, you know, it's not, um, you know, some people say go out and lead. And I know we all talk, go out and lead. Actually, leadership is not a conscious thing. Ambition is conscious. Go out and achieve your ambition. But if you do, when you look back, that is leadership. So you must have the ambition. You must have the dreams. Go for the dreams. And leadership will emerge by you going out for those dreams. But back to my story of, um, of uh, Credit Suisse. I, when I joined the banking side, I was, um, you know, as I said, I spoke with a very strong accent, actually. And I know because <laughs> a lot of people would make me say my name three times and uh, express everything two or three times for them to understand what I was saying. And I remember, uh, you know, one time I was sent to go see a client in one of the other cities. And I, had a, I was a smart guy, I thought. I understood the details very, very well. But after having a meeting with a client for a couple of hours, the client then called my boss and says, thank you for sending John. We honestly didn't understand what the hell he talked about. Can you send us someone else? And my boss sat down with me and said, now, John, we have a problem. <laughs> um, when you talk to me, I see you're smart. You understand everything better than most people here. Yet, the customer is asking for me to send someone else. And I said, well, very good. Why don't you give me an office job for now and let me work on it? And that's exactly what I did. I took an office job, which was building those models I talked about with Karim, and then went to New York University and took what is called accent reduction classes. Okay? Accent reduction classes. Okay, now you are being taught, you know how Americans have a strong accent as well? But you're in a class being taught how to reduce your accent? So that's what I did. But the point I'm trying to make is, again, serve improvement. You want to be a good leader, you must be willing to serve improve. You must work at it. And every failure gives you a chance to succeed. Yeah? As they say, if a door closes, what happens? Or look for a damn window, isn't it? Huh? Don't be locked in. Okay? So that's what I did. So from there, just uh, quick, quickly, because I know we want to, uh, to go to question time. I then um, rose up uh, through Credit Suisse, um, then went to... Bank of America, which by then was the largest bank in the United States. And um, uh, soon enough, I was um, in that, 
in that area where we're creating these models, um, it's called um, uh, financial engineering uh, segment of Wall Street. And I was the first guy to become a managing director in that department, on all of Wall Street, by the way. So uh, it, was, uh, it was a big thing. Um, and then, uh, then I was recruited from there by Barclays Bank to come and run the investment bank in Africa, from South Africa. And from where I ended up being recruited to come and run NIC Bank in Kenya. So that's my journey. I've had many successes and many failures. I hope you picked some of those failures along that story. The point is that in your journey, in your journey which you have embarked on, be prepared for spectacular failures, okay? And be prepared for spectacular success, yeah? At the end of the day, the victors write their own stories, which is why every time everybody talks about their life, we all hear about fantastic things they have done. If I sit here and I tell you I'm the CEO of a bank, you think this guy has had a really successful career, isn't it? It's been easy, it's been success after success. The truth is I've had fantastic failures. And even now I still do, okay? Even now I still do. Leadership, when you're entrusted with it, doesn't mean that you know. It doesn't mean that you know. I cannot tell you how many times I show up at work today and I have no idea what I'm going to do. Happens. Don't tell my people. Yeah? It happens all the time. You show up to work and you have no idea what to do. Yeah? Or something is thrust at you when you least expect it. Yeah? When you least expect it. And you have to rise and lead the rest of the people without knowing exactly where you're going to end. But you have to make sure that when you speak with them, they believe that you know where the hell you're taking. Okay? So that's the follower part of leadership. They must believe that if they follow you, you know where you're taking them. Sometimes you don't. And sometimes you make spectacular mistakes. Yeah? I was thinking on my way here about leadership and mistakes I've made. And I'm... You know, one that came to mind was actually when I was a very small boy out in the village. And I, you know, we were village boys, young. And, you know, back then, um, I want to say late 1970s, uh, it's a long time ago, late 1970s, uh, there were not many cars in the village. There were a few trucks that I remember. And there was a gentleman who had a truck. And he would come to a village to collect stuff, you know, cabbages, you know, whatever, potatoes, whatever, yeah? And as little boys, whenever in the village, when you see a car, you'd get very excited. I'm sure if you go to the village today, you still sort of see them. They still get quite excited when they see a car, yeah? And we'd get very excited about this truck. And I remember one time I led the boys, village boys, there were many of us, like 10 of us. And I told them, listen, this guy keeps coming here, driving his truck. He never gives us a ride. It's our neighborhood, God damn it. It's forcing him to. So the boy said, can we do it? He said, yes, we can. Let him come. So he came. And when he came, he went to the homes, and it was a dead end, right? So you drive a bit further down a few homes, and you turn around, and you're going to come back collecting stuff, yeah? And I got the boys together. We took logs and put them on the road. Logs, eh? On the road, huh? And when he came driving, ooh, he just noticed a huge log. Took it, put it to the side. Before he could go too far, he found another one. And we were hiding in the bush. The third one became very agitated. So we came out of the bush and we told him, you know what? We can help you remove all these logs as long as you give us a ride. He said, is that all it takes? He said, yes, you've been coming here. We want a ride. You don't, God damn it, you don't give us a ride. Let's get on your truck. So he said, fine. So he got on his truck, would drive a bit, get out, remove the log, isn't it? Get to the next one, remove a log. That time I'm looking like a hero, isn't it? I've led the boys. Huh? We've gotten this guy that we're all so afraid of to give us a ride, isn't it? You're the leader. The boys at that point trust you. They know where you're taking them, isn't it? And they're all clapping for you. They're saying, goodness, this guy is good. So we go, we go, we, were, we had many logs, by the way, huh? So after the last one, 
The guy said, you know, I don't think I've taken you enough. Just get on the truck. Let's go, you know, I drop you somewhere where you can still walk home. I said, fantastic. This is good. Let's go. Guys, sure? Yes, let's go. Let's get on the truck. So we got on the truck. Closed it nicely. Drove for a while. Stopped right where you enter the forest. He stopped there. He gets out, like he always did, to come and open for us so we can come and remove the logs. And known to me, he gets into the bush, gets the biggest cane <laughs> anybody can ever hold. And he opens the door, and one by one, we come out. And we get serious thrashing, <laughs> all of us, OK? And everybody hates me. You told us you knew what the hell you were doing. Yeah? Why the hell did we trust you? Why were we following you? What an idiot you are. Now, at that point, I mean, I give that an example of spectacular failures of leadership, isn't it? Because you make judgment. You're so sure you know what you're doing. Yeah? But things do go wrong. Now, when I look back, do I say I shouldn't have done what I did? Absolutely not. I still say fantastic thing that I did, yeah? Because then the whole need to ride on the truck died. Nobody wanted to ride in that truck, right? We have had enough. We had ridden on the truck, and we had gotten a thrashing on the truck. The truck would come, we'd all run away, yeah? We had learned our lesson. But the point I'm making here is don't be afraid to try something. In leadership, you must try. And when you try, sometimes you will fail, okay? So anyway, I think I've talked for too long. Um, let me open it for discussion. A question, yes. Hello? Okay. Uh, just so that I don't block the camera. My name is Tom Olude, and I'm the founder and uh, executive director of a community-based organization. I followed your story, and I think I have a lot to emulate from you. Though I'm wondering, uh, in your journey, what is that, like, decision you made as a leader? And, like, it didn't turn out so well, and, like, you had to take a fall for it, and maybe how you picked up in your career. Thank you. I'll, I'll tell you a very recent story. Yeah? I was, um, a few years ago, I was in South Africa, as I said, yeah? And I was the regional, regional CEO of the, it's called the ABSA Bank, but it's part of Barclays, yeah? Which is now Barclays Africa, as I'm sure you've read in the news. I was the regional CEO, responsible for a number of countries. One of the countries I was responsible for was Mozambique. I asked before and I was told there's nobody from Mozambique, yeah? So I can talk about Mozambique, isn't it? <laughs> Very good. So one of the countries I was responsible for was Mozambique. And I was a board member of Barclays Bank Mozambique. And um, the bank was not performing well. Now, Barclays Bank Mozambique is a very big bank. Uh, Barclays bought, or rather ABSA then, bought what was the equivalent of Kenya's Kenya Commercial Bank. So it was the biggest bank in the country. So I'm serving on the board. I'm also the regional CEO, which meant the CEO of the country reported to me. I'm on the board. And I felt we needed to make a change yeah, in the bank. And I knew full well where we needed to make a change. right? So I just come on. I look at the business, did many business reviews. And I say, this particular department needs a change. OK? And I went through a process of engineering with the head of the department. Basically, we took a department that had 52 people, fired 27 of them, brought in, I don't know, 22 new people, and moved 10 more. Yeah? It was total restructuring, OK? Total ruthless restructuring. And that's another thing. When you're a leader, you have to do ruthless things sometimes. OK? I'm sure you know that. Total ruthless restructuring. Once it was done, then I said, actually, yeah, as the African proverb says, yeah, 
if the leader, if the leading sheep is limping, they will not reach water, isn't it? Yeah? So I need also to change the leader. I've just gone through this process with the leader. We brought new people, changed things, changed job definitions, we created, you know, divisions within departments, and now it was time to change the, the leader. Now, the leader of this was very senior, reported to the CEO, and which meant the board um, is one that selects. At that level, the board has a lot of say. My direct reports I cannot hire without my board saying is okay, yeah? So I was, I did a review with the person and I told them, look, um, this is my review of you, yeah? Uh, and the best thing you can do is resign, okay? Because if you don't, I'm going to fire you. Unbeknown to me, and Mozambique is a funny country <laughs> with very interesting politics, and be known to me, this person was extremely influential, politically. So I told them in no, you know, not mincing my words, that in three months, if you haven't resigned, I'm firing you. I'm coming over, I'm firing you, and uh, let's work towards you leaving, okay? If you want to think about what to do for me, think about what separation needs to look like. And... The next thing I did was I, I then communicated with the board that this person, this is what we're going to do. And the board said, okay, we need to meet. I said, why do we need to meet? I mean, you know, you guys know this is the worst performing department. This is the changes we've gone through. This is, these are the plans we have presented to you, what we want to do. Um, I'm the regional CEO. What's the big deal, right? And my friends, I've never been, been so beaten career-wise in my life, huh? Because the next thing the board did, the, the cheerleader of the board was someone very influential. And at this point, I thought I had recruited her, by the way. I brought a new cheerleader. She was a former prime minister of the country. So those who know Mozambique will know who I'm talking about. She was a former prime minister. I had recruited her. So I thought, really, I recruited you. Should, you should listen to me, isn't it? I brought you on board. But she called a meeting of the board. And at that meeting, it was everybody beating on John Gachora the whole freaking two hours. What the hell are you thinking? Do you know this country? Huh? You think because you went to America, you can tell us what to do. Do you realize this woman, this person is a woman? And do you realize she's pregnant? I did not know, by the way. Huh? <laughs> I did not know she was pregnant. Do you realize she's pregnant? How can you do this? What kind of dismissal is this? Do you know if she goes to the labor court, what's going to happen? We will have you jailed. Went on and on. And it occurred to me, to your question. Obviously, I defended myself. I said, God damn it, I brought you guys on this boat. I'm the na 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 na. And, but it occurred to me afterwards, I made a spectacular mistake. Yes? I should have known, and I knew, that at that level, the board is the one that hired and fired, not individuals. I should have done my homework. I should have talked to the board before I decide to do it, isn't it? <coughs> Back to influence. You must know who are the influencers, who are the key people in your community-based organization, who are the key people that you must get on your side before you do anything. They may have absolutely no value to add, yeah? But you need to get them on site before you act. And that is, leadership is about understanding who are the influencers. As they say, it's really what happens outside the room that matters more than what happens in the room, okay? So here I was quite overruled by a board that, in every other meeting, they would all refer to me. So John, um, what do you think? Are we okay with that? Right? John, um, do you support that? You know, every other meeting, I'll be asked as a final word by the chairman, the chair lady. But I'd made a spectacular mistake. So to your question, yes, I've made many. That one still sticks out because I made many enemies in the process. Uh, people who were close to me on the board became enemies because of that. And I regret it greatly. 
Uh, we'll take two or three questions and then just give you some time to sip some water. Um, my name is Emmanuel Adonio from Uganda. I have a simple question. Um, the initially, I got impressed by your long-term goal when you were young. You said you wanted to be an engineer, yes. and then you achieved that. Then in the middle, you have to you have to change the career to the financial sector. Is that right? Yes. Um, uh, during the leadership course, one of the major problems that I faced, I faced pers personally as a person, and then I'm, I'm learning here right during this leadership course, is to set up long-term goal and you stick to it as a good leader if you want to succeed. What made you change your career goal and how did you su succeed even if you change at the moment at the, at when you're already actually in your engineering department? I'm talking about this because um, I feel right now that uh, people who succeed in leadership position are people who have the financial marshal. You quote me wrong on that. I think I was discussing it with one of our tutor, tutor today because I want to first make sure I have that money so that I can influence people. Could that be your perception? That's why you change from engineering department to the financial department. Uh, as a young person, I get the second question is, one of the thing, the third, I mean the third question, one of the things that w the young people are not active on right now, probably for, uh, during the change in their community is because uh, they tend to be driven away by the financial aspects of their situation or related to political situation in Uganda. A lot of young people are taken to support certain policies that is not favorable to the ordinary people simply because they are paid two million during the election period and they are able to say, no change Museveni, no change this. Um, how do you relate the financial aspect, the leadership, I mean, the leadership as uh, in the um, organizational leadership, then the politics of, the un of an organization. Could you give an highlight and how, we, as young people, we can talk about that? Very good questions. Um, or should I take a few? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. My name is Justin Abuga. I'm from Kenya, and I'm an entrepreneur. Actually, I just got one concern. Uh, Okay, usually this is through a personal experience. Uh, like in Kenya, uh, each bank, okay, most banks, uh, they do have uh, money or grants for innovations, uh, like for youth innovations or for business creation. Yeah, actually, one, 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 uh, like uh, two years ago, I went to a bank uh, to go and ask for that money, which I was actually, I just read in the newspaper, in the Forbes newspaper, was meant for youth for innovations. But it was meant for youth who are innovative, you know, they want to start a business. When I went, I met one director of that bank, I can't mention the name of the bank. What I, I was amazed, they were asking for a collateral. I, I couldn't bring my dad's uh, land or my dad's car as a collateral. So, <coughs> sorry, in your capacity, what are the channels or what are the capacity of, you, of the banks receiving money for the use? And I'm very sure of that, where use, we don't have enough collateral, but yet they expect us to like, utilize this money for uh, better or for, uh, <coughs> for exploitation in terms of our business careers. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Muhammad Abdullahi Guled. I'm Somali from Somalia or Somalia. And make way. <laughs> yeah, I'm Somali. Uh, my question is, and thank you for the wonderful first presentation. We are young leaders who are there first leadership training. And my question is, suppose we are offered like me offered to be executive director or managing director to a certain organization. For profit making organization we call managing director and for, for non-profit organization we call executive director. What's your advice to, 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 to perform as an executive director of that organization and what is your, and what's the day-to-day -day activities or duties that you must perform as an executive director or as a managing director. Thank you so much. Okay. I, I, I hope I've captured 
the questions, but I may ask one of you to repeat, yeah? Is that okay? So my Ugandan friend, um, I think your first question was about goals, long-term goals, isn't it? And um, I guess the specific question is, I changed from engineering to finance. How did I know my long-term goals and how come I've followed it? Eh? And what's my advice to young people on this? Look, I, I'll tell you what I tell young people when I speak to them about goals. There's a lot of pressure to ask people, what do you want to be when, you, when you're older, isn't it? What do you want to be? I heard some of you say presidents, and some of you say UN Secretary Generals, isn't it? I, I, I'll tell you something. If you don't know what you want to be, it's perfectly fine. I did not know what the hell I wanted to be. Okay? It's perfectly fine if you don't. And you're not expected to know what you want to be. Okay? It's a controversial statement I'm making. Huh? It's a controversial one, but it's true. Most people, what they are today, those people we look up to, influential people, it's not like they knew what the hell they wanted to be. For a long time, they didn't. Yeah? For a long time, they didn't. I mean, you see it with our politicians today. Most of them today, I want to be an MP, tomorrow I want to be a senator, next day I want to be governor, I want to... Isn't it? Because you don't always know. And, and then they're even seasoned. So think about younger people like yourselves. How the hell are you expected to know? You don't know the world yet. How the hell are you expected to know what you want to be? I start from there. But that said, that said, there are certain things that you know you have to do. Yeah? There are certain things that you know you have to do. And I'll go through them very quickly. One, I talk about self-improvement a lot. Yeah? Self-improvement. You must be hungry for self-improvement, which is why you're here. You came to Yari for self-improvement, isn't it? So you must have that hunger. That's the first thing. By coming here, you've already seen your goals. You've already seen your goals. By coming here, you've seen your goals. Yeah? That's one. The second thing is nothing will ever replace hard work. I don't care how smart you are. Nothing will ever replace hard work. So no matter what the goals are, you have to work hard at them. Yeah? So you don't need to define that I want to be X. Yeah? But that X will only come because you worked hard. Isn't it? As someone, as, um, I can't remember who said this uh, recently, they said, you know, you can only connect dots backwards, never forwards. <laughs> Steve Jobs, thank you. You can only connect dots backwards, never forwards. In other words, when Steve Jobs woke up every day, he didn't know what the hell he was going to do. But he could tell you what the hell he has done for the last 10 years. And when, when he connected those dots and they worked, he sold the hell out of it, isn't it? Yeah, when it worked and he got the first iPod, he sold the hell out of it. You would have thought the first day he started designing it, he knew what it would be like. He had no idea, right? So the dots get connected backwards, yeah? But the things you must do, self-improvement, hard work. The third thing which is very important, and very important in the African context especially for me, is preparedness. It's preparedness. And I say that because every day you wake up, you hear a politician complaining about something, or you hear the media. I mean, uh, you know, I laughed two years ago when the media complained bitterly about the media bill. Yeah? I actually laughed. Right? They complained bitterly, the media bill, this, the media bill, that, and that. You know what had happened? They never read it until it became law, right? They never read it because no paper had written about it until it was signed, isn't it? And you know why I know that? Because it's the papers. They write stuff that interests them. The fact that they hadn't written anything tells me nobody prepared. You must be prepared at all times. Be fully prepared. And then you got politicians who come out and say things and you're like, uh, where were you? Yeah? It's preparedness. And I'm sure you've been to meetings in Uganda where you walk in 
You know what you are going to talk about, and you realize nobody has done any homework, nobody's prepared. You spend two hours, and the first hour is educating people on things they should have known before you came to the meeting. It's a waste of time, and we suffer from that in Africa. So preparedness is the other thing that you must do to get to your goals. So for me, the last one is understand the finish line. And the finish line is not necessarily a goal. Okay? But understand the finish line. Be very clear in your mind. The activity you're doing, the reason you're self-improving yourself, what's the finish line? If you don't have that in mind, if you haven't thought about what is going to come out of this, then you shouldn't be here. Isn't it? But that does not necessarily define what you're going to be. It just tells you, by the time you finish that, what's the finishing line? This is a race. Yeah? And it's race for now. Then you go prepare for the next race. You prepare for the next race. When you do all the races, then the dots connect. And that's the goal. Okay. So, um, but I think all that said, however, I know I said a controversial statement about goals. I must also say this, that you must have ambition. Yeah? And the goal and ambition are two different things, yeah? Ambition is dreams, and dreams, uh, all our dreams are valid. We are told by Lupita, isn't it? So you must have a dream. You know, m my wife tells me that when we first met, um, which I don't believe is true, but she tells me it's very true, and um, I was looking into her eyes and probably seducing her at that point, so I don't remember half of what I said. But she tells me, when she asked me about my future, I told her I wanted to be CEO of a Kenyan bank. I don't remember that, honestly. I don't ever remember. It's a long time ago. Huh? Remember, remember. I was in the States. I was too young. But apparently, that's what I told her in her first date, that I want to be CEO of a Kenyan bank, <laughs> which means goals are subconscious. You have it. You set the goal up there, yeah? But everything you do, you sort of subconsciously work towards it because of self-improvement, hard work, preparedness, you know, all the things we talked about, yeah? It is because you're preparing yourself for that eventuality that might come. Your second question, and I'll try to go a bit faster this time, was, and I think I'll combine them actually, influence and money, politics and money, isn't it? That's what you talked about. Uh, look, I think, you know, <laughs> There's a movie I watched called Money Talks. Huh? You've seen it, huh? Probably. Or you've heard of it, at least. Money Talks. And money does talk. Yeah? But influence is not necessarily money. Influence is not necessarily money. One of the most influential leaders of my time was Mother Teresa. She had no money. Hmm? She had no money. But her actions were that influential. Yeah? In today's day, Barack Obama is a pretty influential leader. As president of the United States, obviously you're influential because you have a lot of money as well. The country has a lot of money. So yes, there's that word influence. But as an individual within America, Barack Obama did not have the upbringing of money. Yet when he did community work, he was very influential. Because it's the authenticity of a person. Influence comes from authenticity and preparedness, as I said before. You're prepared and you're authentic, you'll be influential. If you go to a meeting and you're the most prepared person in that meeting, guess what? You're going to influence the decisions in that meeting. You can trust me on that. Yeah? You're authentic and prepared, you drive the influence. Yeah? So that's what you have to do. The reason that people are so influential often is because they prepare. The reason thieves are so influential is because they prepare. The so-called thieves, these guys who are involved in all this corruption in Uganda, in Tanzania, in Kenya, wherever, they prepare. These people don't sleep, my friends. They work day and night. They prepare. So when you and I show up in the morning having had six hours of good sleep, they have done two hours of sleep, and they spend the other four deciding how they will influence that conversation. Prepare yourself. That's how you become influential. 
as far as young people go with money, look, I think, um, you know, we're talking about, Maggie and I were talking about how Kenya has moved over the 10 years that she has been back. And, we, you know, we sit back and complain a lot about the, uh, the politician, Seveni, with his 30 years and wanting to do another 30. Uh, President Mugabe saying that you rule for another 100, even though he is 90-something. You know, uh, we complain about these things. And yet the young people coming up voting for those people every time, isn't it? And, and it's disheartening for all of us, yeah? But you know, when I think about it, when I think about it, good policies all over the world, good political policies all over the world are made for the middle class, yeah? They are made for the middle class. If you want a country to move forward, let the policies be made for the middle class. Why? Because the middle class pays taxes and the middle class does the consumption, do the spending, isn't it? That's the middle class. However, in a democracy, unfortunately, in Africa especially, the middle class has the least vote for two reasons. One, we are too, we are too few. And two, even those who are here, we don't vote, isn't it? So we have no political influence. I was telling Maggie, one politician I was speaking with, and there was this um, um, Akko Blow. Those who are, the Kenyans know what Akko Blow is, huh? The non-Kenyans, do you know what it is? Huh? You know? No? Akko Blow is, uh, is, uh, is a gadget that the police use to uh, sniff your breath to see whether you've been drinking. You know that gadget? Huh? What is what? Brotherizer, I guess. That's the right word. Yes. Brotherizer. So, the brotherizer. So, I was talking to this politician, and I said, man, these brotherizers, that when, s when they came and they were everywhere, right? You'd see every night on TV, there'd be an influential person or a well-known person, yeah? Who has been caught with one of these. And um, there are people who used to be paid by the media to make sure that as soon as you see somebody we should, who is influential, please call us. We'll be there with cameras, right? So I was talking to this uh, member of parliament. And I said, guys, this is stupid. This thing is on the roads. It's scaring the hell out of us, right? People are not going out. People are not spending. We are grinding the economy to a halt because we can't go out and spend because if we do, you'll, cut, you'll catch us. And this politician told me, well, John, you realize that that issue is not going to go away. I said, what do you mean? You're politicians. You should be debating it in parliament and, you know, kick it out. He said, it doesn't affect us. It's a middle class problem. It's a middle class problem. He said, if they caught one of my voters, I would complain. You're not my voter. Right? So I don't care about you. I care about my voters. None of them has complained because none of them drives. Yeah? And then he said, well, the other person I worry about is obviously myself. And he said, for me and my family, we all have drivers, so we'll never be caught. So you middle class who drive, that's your problem. And that's the issue with our politics. Until we have a, a large enough middle class to change the politics, the policies will always be either populist policies for the voters, yeah, or very unpopular policies for the rich, never, f never for the middle class. Okay, so that's, that's my own theory, and I'm sticking with it, okay? Um, but, but one thing I said to Maggie, and Maggie, hopefully you agree with me, is that even with all that, we have made steps forward, right? Let's not beat ourselves too badly. You know, if you look at, as we were saying with Maggie, if you look at New York of 1970 and the New York of today, nothing much has changed. The hairstyles have changed, the fashions have changed, new kinds of shoes have come up, you know, guys have funny walks, you know, music has changed, but the city has not changed, yeah? But look at Kampala of 1970 and Kampala of today. It's very different, isn't it? It's very different. Kampala, and even two years ago, yeah? To today would be a very different, it's a very different city. In two years, when that highway to the airport is done, it would be a very different city. 
In another five years, when they get rid of the border borders, gosh, I hope they do. It'll be a very different city, isn't it? Isn't it? That's Kampala. So you can see the changes that we see. The same thing in Nairobi. Yeah? Maggie was telling me when she came back, there were two malls. Sari Center and Village Market. Yeah? Today, 10 years later, Maggie, I'm sure wherever you live, you can walk to a mall. Yeah? Because that's how much we have changed. So let's not beat ourselves too hard. In all this mess, in all this chaos, we have made a lot of progress. And we will make progress. So keep going at it. Okay? Um, money and grants for innovation. Look, I think, <coughs> you know, this is something that um, gives us, all of us bankers, a very tough time, honestly. Because, you know, we don't make money un unless we lend. You know? You've got to understand that. We don't make money unless we lend. So we actually want to lend. Yeah? We have to lend. If I don't lend, I lose my job. Okay. Let's first agree, isn't it? So it's in my interest to lend. But I also know it's not my money. If I lend you the money and you don't pay it back, I also lose my job. Yeah? So what it means is that I encourage you as much as I can to come to talk to me. I've got the money. But when you come for it, I also have to ensure that you pay it back. Yeah? Now, what, what is happening, though, is we have made some progress on it. And I'll tell you what we have done. If you go to the developed world, they use, you see, when you lend somebody money as banks, we look at two things, really. Really, just two things. We look at, one, the ability to pay that money back. Yeah? That's the first thing we look at. Is this person able to pay this money back? That's one. The second thing we look at is, is this person willing to pay the money? And those two are not the same. Okay? Is this person willing to pay the money? Okay. So security usually is to force the will. It's not like we want to take your land and sell it. No, actually, banks don't like to sell land. It's a complicated process. You're not good at it. But it forces people to want to repay. Because there are a lot of people who can actually pay that never pay. Yeah? So you must find another way to force them to want to pay. Is that okay? So when you come to us, the first thing we look at, are you able to pay it back? And even if you are, we still ask the second question, are you willing to pay that money back? What we are doing, and this came in a few years ago, working together with the Central Bank of Kenya, talking about Kenya now, and the same story with Uganda and Tanzania, is we started the Credit Reference Bureau. What the Credit Reference Bureaus do is they take your historical behavior, financial behavior. And based on that, we can predict your willingness. Okay? That doesn't, it doesn't tell us the ability, but we can predict your willingness. And then you knowing that if you don't pay, you'll be listed, forces you to have the will to pay. So I think over time, as that database gets bigger and bigger, the need for security will become less and less. In developed world like America, when you go to a bank, very quickly they run something, they'll be able to tell you, you, John, you never, you don't pay your debt. They can see it there, yeah? Or if they see you do, they give you the loan and they tell you you have a very good credit rating score. Don't mess it up because if you do, nobody will give you a loan and if they do, it will be too damn expensive. So that forces you to want to repay. So that's where we're going. It's an evolving journey, but we'll get there. Okay. My friend Mohammed, Executive Director. Well done. Um, Gosh, you know, day to day, what do you need to do? You have to, and I know I'm going to, I'm going to contradict myself when I say that, but you have to lead. Yeah, I said before, leading is not conscious, but I'll contradict myself and say, you have to lead. Yeah? And leading means that you've you, you got to ask yourself, the people that you're going to, to lead, 
what is it they want? Because you're executive director or managing director, you're leading people. You follow us. You're not the expert in the room. And don't try to be, yeah? I don't try to be an expert in my job, I'm not. Well, in everything that happens in the bank, I'm not an expert. Most of it, I don't know. My banking was on Wall Street, very different from what I do today, yeah? So I'm not an expert. But there's certain things I think about the people that I lead. One is that you must, and this is something I've always told, so I'm using someone else's notes, but I believe in them. You must show the people you lead something they themselves cannot see. That's the first thing you must do. For your followers, I'm talking about the followers, not about the leader. You must show them something that they themselves cannot see. Okay? And you have to strive every morning to think what that thing is. Yeah? What is that? What is that thing that you want to show them, tell them, inspire them about that they themselves cannot see? The second thing that I think about is my own competences. They must be able to trust my competences. They cannot doubt them. Okay? So, Competence sometimes meaning saying, I don't know. That's a competence in itself. When you don't, you say you don't know. But when you say you do know, then there, mu there must be no doubt in the way you say it, in the way you carry yourself, that you don't know. You need to be authentic. I talked about that before. You have to be very authentic. They look at you, you know, they look at the way you walk into the office. Remember that. If you walk into the office and you're like this, uh, <laughs> been beaten overnight by my wife. <laughs> uh, they know it. Huh? You don't have to say They can see it. Huh? They can see it immediately. And all of them will act as though they have been beaten by their wives. They all be like this for the whole day. Right? So even you have been beaten overnight by Fatima. Please show up and look like Fatima did not touch you. <laughs> huh? Just show up. Okay? And pretend like Fatima did not touch you because today you're leading, you're in charge. Yeah? The times I walk, I drive to work, or I, when I get driven to work, I get to the office and I'm feeling, gosh, do I want to get out of this car? I'm feeling really beat, yeah? It's been a rough night, didn't sleep, kids were up, whatever, you know. But when I get out of that car to walk into the office, I have to just shake myself up and say, you know what? I'm responsible today. And that's what you have to do. You have to be authentic. You have to be honest. Authentic and honest are two different words, but you have to be honest. People must trust every word that you say. Because you'll be telling people a lot of things, some things they don't want to hear. But if you're honest about it, they will go and absorb it. If you're dishonest, then every word you tell them creates a water cooler moment. They'll go to the corner and talk, discuss what you just said. Right? He said, today is sunny. Let's go to the corner. Let's talk. You know this guy, huh? It's today is sunny. You know, uh, you know we don't trust him, huh? Can somebody go look out to see whether it's sunny? You know what I mean? If they don't trust you, that's what they will do. And lastly, and this is the hardest one for all of us as leaders, is the one somebody who gives a meaning to their lives. Somebody who gives them a meaning. I'm sure if you're in community work, you said, that is key for you. You are giving me you are helping them give meaning to their lives, isn't it? And that's why they will follow you. That's why. Community organizers are very good at this. That's why Barack Obama was so good. Because that's what he did was help people find meaning in their lives. As a leader, you have to do that as well. Yeah, the hardest question you have to ask yourself is why? Why does somebody wake up and come to work? Why? And you've got to give a meaning to that. It's a very tough question. Okay. So, can I conclude? Okay, so I think it's been, uh, it's been good for all of us. Um, I've talked a lot about leadership because I was warned that's what we're talking about tonight, Maggie, right? So, I thought uh, I would just give you a few points that... Um, that, you know, take home points. Key points. I mean, to be a leader, you must have values 
you must have ethics, you must have integrity. That's what makes you authentic. I talked about authenticity, values, ethics, integrity. Leadership is consistent. Leadership is consistent. You can be fantastic at one moment, but the moment you abandoned that value, not fail, failure is fine, but when you abandon that value of leadership, you're no longer a leader. I give the example of, if you look at this country, our own country, and again, I paraphrase for the non-Kenyans. Our former president, Daniel Arab Moy, was a president for 24 years. When he took power in 1978, yeah? The first five years of President Moy, he was known as the tree planting president. Everywhere he went was about tree planting, was about the environment, planting trees. And if you look into old pictures, documentaries of the president, former president, you see him planting trees, okay? That's what he was known for. He cared about the environment. He cared about tree planting, isn't it? And then at some point, he allowed his own people to devastate our forests. Okay? He devastated our forest. They were cut down. Where there were forests, he planted tea. In other places, it was left bare. Okay? I believe President Moi planted way more trees than Wangari Mathai could ever dream of planting. Yet today, who do we think planted trees in this country? That is what I mean. You have to be consistent. If the president had been consistent, we'll be talking about him today about planting trees. But even though he planted more trees than anyone else in this country, or managed to make us plant more trees than anyone else in this country, we don't remember him. We remember Wangari Mathai who planted way far fewer trees than the president. Consistency is very important. Leadership often is achieved unconsciously. Ambition is conscious. Leadership often is unconscious. You achieve it looking back, not looking forward. People talk about it. People talk about it. A leader must remember the two most important resources that they have. The first one is direction, is a resource. An idea of where you're going is a resource. Communicate, share that resource with everybody. It's a resource. The second resource you have is a team. Your job is to connect the two resources, direction and the team. Make sure they connect. They'll get you where you need to go. Remember your resources. A leader understands that he may fail, but he soldiers on. Mistakes are made by those who win, not by those who never try. You don't win the lottery by not buying a ticket, just as you don't lose the lottery by not buying a ticket. It's only those who buy a ticket that can say, I won or I lost. You have to be in the race. Okay? It doesn't matter how much you scream at your team. As an offense, no offense. <laughs> uh -uh. If your team is losing, there's nothing you can do. You're not in the field. Okay? You're not in the field if your team is losing. It is only for those in the field. So leadership is about being in the field. Success is never guaranteed, but always give yourself the best chance. And I talked about how you give yourself the best chance. It's self-improvement, hard work, preparation, and understanding the finish line. A leader believes in himself or herself. He's self-aware of what he is capable of. But more importantly, and this is key, he is aware that he is capable. Okay? He is aware of what he's capable of, but he is also aware that he is capable. 
I say often that the words cannot do don't form part of my vocabulary. I don't use those words. I believe I can. Always. The only time I cannot do is because of time, not because of ability. Because I can find the resources to get it done every time. Okay? And you too believe that. You can find the resources to get it done every time. So, believe always you are capable. Keep trying. Lastly, leadership is not the same as management. You don't have to be at the top to lead. You don't have to be at the top to lead. In fact, the best leaders are usually the first followers. Have you ever been at a party and you're all looking around and some music comes on and you realize everybody is so uptight, nobody wants to dance, and that crazy person gets up and starts dancing? Yeah? What happens? Hmm? Usually, no. That's not true. Usually, the people sitting down laugh at the crazy person until a second person follows. Yeah? So usually if you're the only one, everybody laughs at you. Until the second person gets up and joins that crazy person. Then everybody joins. So the leader isn't the crazy person, it's the second person who got up, the follower. Okay? So leadership does not mean you have to be at the top. Okay? It is the one who goes against the tide. The tide was casting that first person as crazy person. That was the tide. But the second person went against that tide by standing up and joining that crazy person. And then you all join. Just next time you're at a dance, just observe. you see. you see. The first person completely gets ignored. It's a crazy. But once number two rises... Then it's a party. Everybody gets up to dance. Okay? So you don't have to be at the top to lead. You, however, must be the daring one to go against the tide. That's what leadership is. So thank you very much. I've really enjoyed this, um, this conversation. It's been a bit long. Uh, but I hope that uh, as I've learned a great deal about you, I hope you've learned a thing or two about me as well as about my views about leadership. And I wish you all the very best. Thank you.